Welcome friends to another r slash pro revenge video. Today we've got some revenge on an awful manager, but first a story from Mad Rocket Scientist 74, the saga of the beard. I'm one of those guys that's a bit her suit, except for my head which is bald, go figure. As such I started shaving a lot earlier than many of my peers, age 12 if I recall correctly. I was shaving daily before I got to high school. For the most part, I kept shaved because beards are itchy. However, during my junior year of high school, very early 90s, during January in Wisconsin, I had been letting things grow a bit because it was freaking cold outside and nothing is colder than a freshly shaved face. The school's principal took exception to my four-day beard and told me that I had better come to school tomorrow with a clean shave or I'll shave you myself. Now, my principal was a small, around 5'2", man who was very much past retirement age. The idea of him managing to shave me himself was amusing, as I was easily a head taller than him, 16, and had at least 50 pounds on him. Still, he was the principal and I wasn't certain if I was violating a dress code or whatnot, so I went home and shaved. Then I talked to my parents, who advised me to keep shaving for the school year, but to also read the student handbook carefully. And so I did, and I learned a great many things from the reading which I shared with my parents. That summer, despite the heat and humidity, I grew out my beard. It was big and beautiful and a deep dark red in color. Mom was a redhead, I got it from her. I kept it neatly trimmed and got a great many compliments on it over the summer, and more than a couple of dates. First day of school rolls around, the start of my senior year, and I walk in with my fabulous beard. My locker, which I'd been using since freshman year, was right outside the school's office. So before the bell for homeroom had even rung, as I was talking to friends and moving towards class, I felt a hand on my shoulder and I was spun around to see the top of the principal's head. First mistake, he put hands on me for no good reason, he was shaking in fury. He says, you need to go home and shave right now. I say, no I don't, I need to get to homeroom, home's 10 miles away, I don't have time to do that. He says, you're not going to spend the day in this school with that beard. You need to leave now. I say, are you suspending me from school? They say, yes, you are suspended. Get out and don't return until you're clean shaven. Q compliance slash revenge. I went home. 10 mile drive took about 15 minutes. I walk in the door. Mom sees me, asks me what happened. I tell her. She mentions that the school never called to inform her that I was suspended and on my way home. Mistake the second. Mom says, call your father at work, here's his office number. I call dad, give him the story. He tells me to sit tight and help mom out for the day. Mom runs a daycare out of the home. The kids all love me and are excited to have me around for another day. The day goes by like all the other days of the summer. Dad comes home about 5 and tells me about his fun set of phone calls this afternoon. See, this was all planned out. We really had read the handbook and we knew both the principal and the vice principal. Had the principal been smart, he would have noticed me, brought me up to the VP who was in charge of student discipline, and the VP, a very level-headed guy, would have handled the situation properly. I would have had a chance to argue my case to the VP and explain that the student handbook had no such verbiage regarding facial hair beyond student hair must be kept neatly trimmed. My beard was neatly trimmed. I was following the rules as written. If he disagreed with me and upheld the suspension, he would have followed protocol, which would have involved calling my parents to let them know I was suspended and heading home. But we knew the principal was prone to rage hard-ons and would probably screw this up. So once dad heard that he had touched me and suspended me without calling mom, he got on the phone with the district superintendent. Small town Wisconsin here folks, everyone knows everyone. A very brief discussion ensued where my father mentioned that the principal had laid hands on me and suspended me and sent me home without parental notification. All over the fact that I had a beard which was not expressly forbidden in the student handbook or anywhere else in the school rules, regs, and etc. So not only was there assault but also truancy slash contributing to the delinquency of a minor and a possible civil rights issue. Of course, none of that might stick, but dad was willing to start calling the sheriff and a lawyer and making life miserable for the super if he didn't get his subordinate in line. I went to school the next day with an excused absence and my glorious beard. 
I wore that beard for the next two weeks, long enough for everyone to see it and the story to get around to everyone. Then I shaved the whole thing off, cause gosh darn it all, that thing was hot and itchy. During the winter, I would grow it, shave it, grow it again, all just to spite that old short jerk. When hunting season started rolling around, I noticed a lot of other young men in school growing their beards out. Sitting in a cold tree stand for hours at a crack, a beard is a nice thing to have. He retired at the end of that year. I'm pretty sure I had something to do with that. You know, I never really thought too hard about why a lot of hunters often have these big beards. But now I'm kind of curious if the situation OB described here is a common reason for them having grown out these beards. Though maybe that's just, you know, the gruff, outdoorsy, woodsy thing to do anyways. Do you guys think when it comes to high schoolers who may even just be starting to get the beginnings of a beard, that even in that situation it's still weird policing them and saying, you've gotta shave that beard? Let me know what you guys think down in the comments. Our next story is from Santa's other brother. Now I have to fix Peter's screw up? After making prototype springs for a year, I got transferred to another department because of company politics. Okay, whatever. My new boss is in charge of stamping production and secondary operations. Over time, prototypes that I'd successfully made were put into production. One that sticks out of my mind was a half-hard stainless with two bends. One of the bends was 180 degrees and the legs had to be parallel. Spring back could be a problem, but I got it. Months later, the tool room makes a progressive die to produce these parts. The blinking was straightforward, no problem. The 180 degree bend would likely require a secondary operation. The parts would come off the progressive die, semi-finished. Another operation would finish the parts. Our friend Peter is going to make the secondary die. He struggles and screws with this for over a week. Can't get it. Won't ask how I did it. He gives up. Die disappears in the middle of the night. I make a new one, another week, still can't get it. He changes the part design to a pair of tight radius 90 degree bends. Less spring back, convinces the president that a 180 degree bend can't be done. President has to convince the customer that a 180 degree bend can't be done. But they never change the drawing. Eventually he gets the part approved. Job is released to my new boss for production. New boss decides, the parts are ugly and don't match the drawing. Wants me to modify the tooling to make the parts correctly. I protest. He insists. Whatever. This was Monday AM. I managed to drag it out for maybe 5 hours. Parts were perfect. Tuesday AM, running good parts to print. Wednesday morning, weekly meeting of the supervisors. I gave a good few parts to my boss to show off in the meeting with the president and Peter. Also dropped a dozen good parts on Peter's desk and some of his toolbox as reminders. Several days later, Peter comes walking by. You got that bend radius figured out? I say, yeah, it was easy. He left. This is just freaking annoying. Imagine trying to work with people who literally refuse to ask you for advice on how to do something. You finished your job and passed it on to your teammate, Peter, and this dude would rather just try to change the entire piece rather than just suck it up and ask you how to do it. They just give up and say, nah, that's not possible. It's unreasonable. Just change the part. Well, OP did it just fine. If you just ask OP, they would tell you. Unless you're Batman, you kind of have to hate the do-it-alone types. By the way, if you're enjoying these stories, make sure to hit those like and subscribe buttons down below so you never miss any of my daily videos. Our next story is from Bad Stage 8133. He cheated. Not the first time either. After begging for chances after cheating, after chasing off any guy I tried to date after him, I stupidly gave him another chance. Well, not surprisingly, he did it again. Three years of this BS off and on. I could have destroyed his reputation or messaged the women, letting them know he's a scumbag. Nah, I bought a highly concentrated fart spray that smells absolutely horrendous. Reviews say you have to use gloves while spraying because if it gets on your hands, the smell will take days to remove, even after intense washing. I sprayed the inside of his car with it. He's been missing his passenger window for years. I saturated it. Good luck picking up any more women while smelling like a cesspool. I hope it gets on his clothes too so he has to walk around at these clubs and bars stinking too. 
Just imagine going on a date with a guy for the first time and you get in their car and it just reeks. They don't say anything about it. They're not pointing it out or apologizing for whatever it could be. Totally reeks. This dude will not be able to pick anybody up for a long time. Our next story is from Octo23. Neighbor moves after I install a camera. I live in a semi-detached house and share a driveway. When I first moved in, an older British couple lived next door. I got along with them great. Then the wife passed and the husband moved to an apartment and sold the house to someone I'll call Cece. Initially, there were no issues with Cece, but sometimes she did things that annoyed me. However, for the most part, I was able to ignore her and her extended family. On one occasion, I found the roof of my spouse's car dented after it was left on the street. On another occasion, I found damage to my spouse's car, and the easiest explanation was if someone backed out of CC's driveway without looking. I didn't have any firm evidence, just circumstantial evidence. So I installed a camera, no audio, just video, on my garage that looked out over the shared driveway and street. I then went and told all of my neighbors about the damage to the car and the new camera. Nobody verbalized any concerns, and nobody admitted to the damage. By the end of the next week, Cece had listed her house for sale, and it closed quite quickly and I had a new neighbor. Now, Cece was a realtor, and should have known the law about vacating her old house, but she was still making trips with her stuff long after the new owner showed up. Cece ended up suing the new owner because she had left stuff behind that she was trying to recover. On one morning as I was leaving for work, I saw the legal papers on the windshield of the new owner's car so I made a point of asking about them. This is when I learned about all of the drama and the ongoing issues. The new owner indicated that they were going to have to document everything to defend themselves in court. This is where the petty revenge came in. I asked if the new neighbor wanted video footage. I provided footage of multiple loads of furniture being moved past the deadline. I provided footage of CC's sister sneaking across my property to try and serve the new neighbor and then illegally leaving the paperwork on the car. I also provided footage of CC driving by at random times. With the footage that I provided, the case was awarded to my new neighbor that had to counter sue CC. I don't know what the deal is overall with CC here, but very clearly they must have been the one that impacted OP here. But also, everything beyond that is just like, why are they acting that way? And like, why was there even a situation where the new owner moves in and you even have anything still there? Why wouldn't you move everything out before the new owner moves in? Our next story is from New Bosterone. Unsubscribe. My partner and I share a PayPal account. My email's associated with it. I've had it since PayPal was new. Does anyone else remember when PayPal was a new way to pay on eBay and they gave you $10 for signing up? When my partner uses the account, my email gets used for the transaction. Order placed. Your order's been shipped. Tell us how we did. Often it also gets signed up for marketing emails. What do I care about wigs for self-conscious poodles or cat polishing creams? I forward the transaction details to her account. About once a month I would go through and unsubscribe to all the marketing crap. I finally hit my limit. Now when I unsubscribe, I sign her email account up. Enjoy hearing about the wonders of feline shine. I honestly think it's about time for OP and their partner to separate. PayPal accounts. It's easy enough to make your own and separate them. It's all good. Our next story is from Lemon Anomal. Got a bully to fail gym. My high school had a huge gym for the upperclassmen. It was an indoor track that could house all the sophomores, juniors, and seniors. During the warmer months, the teachers would open the doors up so fresh air could get in. They would always close the door about five minutes into class to start roll call. This left a good window for the cool kids in the school to ditch beginning class warm-ups. I don't remember what they called it. All they had us do was walk around the track. During the day in question, I was walking around the track when my teacher yelled at me to help close the doors. I closed the door closest to me and started walking to my teacher's spot of the gym when I heard banging at the door. I went, crap, because I locked someone out and quickly opened the door. Once opened, I saw like five kids walk in with the leader of the group giving me a death stare. Now this guy was like a foot shorter than me, around five feet and had some muscles. He stomped over to me, I'm six foot and was chunky, looked up at me and said something along the lines, Were you trying to get us in trouble? 
I quickly apologized and tried laughing it off saying, My bad, I should have checked, but no harm done. He wasn't having any of that. He kept at me saying that he wanted to fight me because I was going to get them in trouble and how he was going to kick my butt or something like that. At this point, I was very annoyed because I just wanted to get Jim over with and thought it would be funny to trick this kid. I went, oh, okay then, let's meet in the bathrooms right outside the gym and I'll fight you there. Those bathrooms were notorious for fights. He said something like, bet, meet me there, which I was surprised he thought I would do it. He left and after like a minute or two later, I went to my gym teacher for roll call. The whole class period, I didn't see him in the gym. I didn't think much of it and continued my class. Once class got dismissed, I saw this guy meet up with the rest of us by the locker room looking defeated. One of the guys from his group said, What happened to you? I chimed in and said, Yeah, what happened to you? In a sarcastic tone, he just stood there saying nothing while looking at the ground. The icing on the cake is that due to this, he was considered absent from the class. And from what I remember, he would fail if he missed another class. So my little joke got the kid to fail the easiest class in school. I think it's honestly pretty easy to not have much sympathy for a guy like this who wants to go around threatening people, essentially trying to bully people. Well, enjoy your F in gym class. It's honestly hilarious that they fail gym class because in most gym classes around the country, you pass if you're just there. Our next story is from Black Chuck Flame. Trying to get your rocks off at the library? Not on my watch. Had a male sounding customer call in about exercise books. My younger female colleague had picked up the phone first and was frustrated that he kept beating around the bush while she was trying to help him and asked if I could take over. He just wanted lists of titles but didn't really care any more about them than that. I asked if he'd like me to place them on hold so he could pick them up, to which he answered that he didn't see very well or was blind, I forget which. So that wouldn't do him much good. And if I could just look up stuff online for him and describe the exercises to him instead. At this point, I'm thinking this whole call is sus. It eventually turned into him asking specifically about exercises to strengthen his groin area and used every logical opportunity to say groin. By this point, my suspicions about the apathy about the book titles had turned into outright eye rolling and the understanding that I was talking to an older grown man who hadn't matured past 12. I smiled to myself and decided it was time for some revenge and self-entertainment. I peer around the corner to see if one of my colleagues is at his desk. He is. After a while of not being able to find anything that essentially says for me to tell him to please himself, I tell him as professionally as I can that I'm out of resources and I could forward him to the librarian who might be more qualified to help him, failing to mention that the librarian was a man. The customer seems to perk up and seems excited that he's going to get another target to mess with. Perfect. I put him on hold. I tell the librarian about the situation and my suspicions and why I was specifically asking him to take the call. If the customer hangs up, he's a confirmed perv. If not, he's a weirdo with a genuine question. My colleague agrees, pulls up some info in case the customer is genuine, and picks up the phone to start introducing himself. He barely gets his name out when he turns to me and says the guy hung up. I'm really hoping I killed whatever excitement the jerk was trying to develop. My older female coworkers were concerned for me and my younger colleague who'd initially taken the call, but I told them I was fine and had a good laugh at the perv's expense. Apparently it wasn't his first time calling, but hopefully it'll be his last, knowing that someone will play their own games with him. Do you guys think that if they continue to try to do this ever again in the future, that this is something you give to the police? I mean, you have their phone number. You can go straight to the police and say, this guy is calling not even like a regular person, but the library and harassing the librarians on the phone. Is that possible? I think you'd want to try to get this guy held responsible for their ridiculous actions beyond the simple thing of just like blocking them. Because let's be real, if they're doing this calling up the library, they're probably calling other places as well. This next story is from Nazdrala. Now that is a prank. Once worked with a guy who thought a prank was walking by my desk and knocking the mouse off my desk. Well, he put in his two weeks notice, so I decided he needed to see a real prank before he left. 
I printed out a bunch of pieces of paper, saying the clowns are coming to get me and hid them all over his desk. For the next week, he was finding them and flipping out. Week two, I hid little pictures of clowns in the exact same places I hid the notes. Day two of finding the clowns and he flips out. He thinks new ones are being added every day when he goes out to lunch. The absolute best one though is the one between the picture of his girlfriend and the frame it was kept in. I often smile to myself thinking about how long till he finds it and the whole two weeks will come flooding back to him in an aneurysm inducing rage. I love the idea of slipping the clown picture inside the frame because while I feel like there might be a realistic chance that maybe they never open that frame up and find it themselves, there is that real chance that two years, three years down the road they still have it, they open it up to change the picture, and what do they see waiting for them but that clown? Our next story is from Long Jumping Wallaby 8, pettiest of petty revenge is The Slow Mouse. One of my first jobs back in the early 2000s was in a small office. There were two partners and about three poop kickers, me being one of the latter. The guy I shared my office with, Dwight, was responsible for training me up. Since he trained me up, he considered himself my manager, he was not. Dwight was a strange little man, thin, early 30s, single, lived with his mother, scout leader, liked hiking, murdering hitchhikers, etc. He gave off weird vibes. Anyway, since he considered himself my manager, he would always pass off the tedious tasks to me and do the easier, more interesting things himself. I stuck with this for a few years but got sick of Dwight managing me and put my notice in and left for another role elsewhere. With two weeks to go, I thought I'd enact some petty revenge. Dwight stepped away from his desk and I got to work. I opened up the mouse and pointer settings and slowed the drag speed of his mouse almost down to zero. If you've never done this before, the result is that your pointer moves across the screen at a snail's pace. You can't even get from one side of the monitor to the other without having to lift the mouse up off the table and bring it back down as the mouse falls off the mouse pad. So for two weeks, I listened to the sweet sound of Dwight slapping a mouse across his desk and constantly lifting it up and placing it back down again. He never questioned the speed never asked for help either. I love the story because OP is one bears beats Battlestar Galactica away from really being Dwight's co-worker. Our next story is from Free Somewhere 1643, Resignation Inbound. Working for an awful department, my fiancé resigned because of a better job offer, but left sooner because my boss wouldn't give him time off to collect his deceased father's belongings. Mismanaged department all around with crappy co-workers who are just as compliant, resigning this week to move East Coast. They're lucky I'm giving them three weeks notice and it's only because we could use the extra money during the move. And I'm taking all the crap I brought over the years with me. The pencil cups, the binder holders, my shelves, the girl's locker room I decorated with my money. All of that crap is going with me. Screw you guys, I'm going home. I think OP has a little bit more to let out here. What did they do that just clearly has gotten OP very frustrated and worked up. Go out on a blaze of glory, man. Take what's yours. This next story is from Marsupial Old 5325 Thanks for the free coffee. This happened yesterday while in the drive-thru at a coffee shop with a double-lane drive-thru. At this shop, the one that's trending with the meanings of the color of the straws that the barista gives you, the one with the windmill, they have multiple lanes, and they come out to your car and take your order, and then you drive up to the window to collect your order. There is usually one order taker for each lane. A lady in the lane next to me couldn't wait her turn to give her order to the order taker in her lane. As the order taker for my lane walked up to my window, she honked her horn to tell the order taker that she was there before me and that she was next. Order taker then apologized to me that they had to help this lady, even after telling her that her order taker would be with her shortly. I tell the order taker, no big deal, I'm not in a hurry. Cue the petty revenge from the order taker. As the order taker for that lane was walking back to her car, the one that was pulled away from her lane tells the one for the lady's lane that my order is on the house because they were pulled away. Because she demanded that her order was taken next because she was there first. Sweet, free coffee for me. 
The second part is that while I was waiting to collect my order from the window, one of the baristas come walking out and hands my drink to me, skipping the impatient lady that was in front of me. Because she couldn't wait roughly one minute for her order taker, I got free coffee and faster service. This is absolutely wonderful for OP, but let's be real, let's lay all of our cards here on the table. Let's say you pull up to a fast food place, you legitimately do pull in first, and somebody who pulls up after you is getting served first. We would all be a little upset in that situation, right? I feel like just about everybody would be sitting there in the car in their mind going, oh come on, really? No, I don't think many of us would yell or make a scene, but... I feel like at least partially it's a little justifiable for them to be a little upset. Our next story is from Which Woman? Hope you're enjoying your wind chime. My upstairs neighbor has a loud wind chime. I asked for it to be taken down because it makes noise at all hours. I didn't think that wind chimes could be so annoying, but they can be when you're trying to sleep, regardless of the hour. Two weeks later, I get a call from the landlord that my neighbors are complaining about me smoking on my patio at night. I work second shift. If I get home at 2 a.m. and want to smoke, what else am I to do, I asked. I was told I could walk around the corner of the building and smoke there, in a dark, dirty corner 20 feet from my patio, closer to the bedrooms? Okay, well, apparently that's not a solution because this weekend the wind chimes are back up, and the neighbors are out of town apparently, stifling the rage and almost irresistible desire to yank that thing down and feign ignorance, I sat back and gave it some thought. Today I went out and bought a big stinky cigar, appropriately named Punch. I'm now looking forward to my neighbor's return. Man, I do not envy anybody that has to live in close quarters living like that. Just imagine trying to live your life and do something that is very commonplace, like smoking, and being told, no, you can't go out on your outside patio where you live and smoke. What are you, crazy? I don't even like the idea of smoking or cigarettes, and that still pisses me off. And our final story of the day is from House Consistent 5160, they deserved it. About six years ago, I was an installer for a water softener company. At first, the job was good. The pay was nice, and while it was an on-call job, the hours weren't all that bad. Once you were done with your installs, you went home. You got a week of sick and a week of vacation time per year, had a 401, and they covered a decent portion of the insurance. Not the greatest, but at least it was something. Well, fast forward a few years, and the owners got more and more greedy, buying very expensive luxury cars and charging them to the company taking family vacations on the company dime, and even taking company money to go gambling with. I know this because I was really good friends with the comptroller who did their books and taxes. After a while, they took away the vacation and sick time, stopped helping with the insurance, and stopped matching with the 401, because they didn't make enough to cover all that and blow the money on luxury cars and vacations and gambling. Their excuse was, they were a small family company and couldn't keep doing it, but a few of us knew the truth. Next, they made us stay on call all day, every day, even after the installs were done. So they could ram in last second installs at all crazy hours. Imagine showing up at a home at 8 p.m. to do a three hour install on a school night at a home that's two hours away and they have no idea you're even coming because the owners told the salesperson to just lie to them. So you get yelled at, told to leave, get home at 10 p.m., and then have to be back at the office at 7 a.m. just to show back up at the same house again the following day. This happened constantly and it got worse and worse. Then they started purposely cutting hours, so if you got stuck working two or three 13-hour days, you'd then only work three to four-hour days the rest of the week. So you got no overtime, while some other unlucky sap got nailed with the time instead, only to get their hours cut the next few days, so on and so forth. A few other installers complained and were told basically, too bad, deal with it. People started quitting, and the owners actually just told people to pack their stuff and never come back. The day they turned in their two-week notices. They were so petty, they made people who really needed the money go without paychecks for two weeks when they were just doing the right thing by giving notice. I had enough and had the same conversation the others did, and sure enough, after seven years of busting my butt for them, I was told, 
this is how we do things now. We're not changing it just for you, so if you don't like it, find a new job. Well, I immediately started looking, and after a few weeks, found a good job with a city municipality. I actually used the work truck to show up for the interview in between jobs. I gave zero notice and just turned all my stuff in that Friday night after I got paid. When they asked me what the freak was going on, I told them, I took your advice. They said, huh? What advice? I said, well, you told me to find a different job, so I did. Oh, and by the way, I showed up at the interview in your work vehicle, so thanks for paying for the gas to get me there. I also returned the truck on about 1 16th of a tank, just so they'd have to fill it up. And I didn't clean it at all. It was petty, yes, but it made me feel better. This is literally one of those situations where your employer doesn't even care about you. They think you're some disposable, brainless worker that is just instantly replaceable if you're not just happy doing ridiculous hours and ridiculous work. So they didn't deserve any kind of consideration in return. So honestly, OP was good for doing what they did because they looked out for themselves. These employers wouldn't have. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. Now, if you want to hear another revenge story that was absolutely crazy, click on that left video. Or if you missed my latest video, check out the one on the right. That said, I'll see you all next time with some more stories.